We apologize for interrupting your doom scrolling. Now, for some positive leftist news. Hello and welcome to Positive Leftist News. My name is Louise of the YouTube channel Matriarchetype and I will be your host this month. Now, it's more important than ever to highlight the progressive and positive movements happening around the world. I'm sure I'm not alone when expressing how difficult this month has been. But comrades, you are not alone. In fact, I'm right here with you now. <laughs> Together we can make positive, real change, and that starts by understanding what's happening around the world today. Let's make a start, shall we? The Winamim Wintu tribe in Northern California has successfully purchased 1,080 acres of ancestral land after nearly a decade of effort. The tribe used more than $2 million in private donations to fund the purchase, with additional funding dedicated to constructing an eco-village. The Wenamim Wintu tribe has also been working to reintroduce their sacred salmon, the Winter Run Chinook, to the McLeod River and to conserve their ancestral lands and sacred sites. Land rights provide the security and freedom to practice traditional livelihoods, manage the ecosystem and build sustainable, affordable housing. While we don't believe indigenous peoples should have to buy their land back from colonizers, whether through donations or not, this is a significant and welcomed win for the Winamum and the salmon they care for. Land back now. The BC Supreme Court has ruled that First Nations in British Columbia must be consulted before any mineral claims are made in their territories. The decision transforms the province's mineral rights regime, which operated according to the Gitzala Nation and Ihadhasset First Nation, based on colonial holdover regime, where basically anyone could stake a claim in First Nations territory without a duty to consult or even notify them, with devastating impacts to their land and cultural and spiritual sites. The court has given the province 18 months to consult with First Nations to change the current process. Although the court did not quash any of the existing mineral claims, the decision signals a significant shift in how mineral rights are addressed and acknowledges systematic issues in the allocation process. Despite its shortcomings, hereditary chief Gitala Smoyget Nishiwa said, the status quo has profoundly shifted. The landscape has totally changed as a result of this decision. Global movement supports Palestine Hundreds of thousands of people around the world mobilised to show their support for Palestine this month as Israel's genocide against Palestinians continue to escalate. Protests took place in many countries, with tens of thousands marching in Jordan, US, Iraq, Iran and Yemen to express solidarity with Palestine. Palestinians also organised their own demonstrations. Gazans, forced to evacuate by the Israeli government, defied orders and took to the streets. In New York City, thousands gathered to protest Israeli forces' actions in Gaza, despite some local officials denouncing the rally. In the UK, participation in the largest pro-Palestine rally to date was estimated at 200,000. Demonstrating their understanding of the US complicity in these war crimes protesters emphasised that the root cause of violence against Palestinians is Israelis' connections to US imperialism. They demanded an end to the blockade, humanitarian aid access and cessation of US aid to Israel. Peoples around the world condemn Israel for the engaging in ethnic cleansing and war crimes in Gaza and these actions show no signs of slowing down. On the contrary, they're just getting started. Tens of thousands mobilise in Rome. Tens of thousands of people gathered in Rome on October the 7th for a protest organised by the Italian General Confederation of Labour, CGIL. The demonstration aimed to oppose the austerity measures and policies that the far-right Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni's government, is pushing. More than 100 groups, including political parties, peace initiatives and youth networks supported the protest. The rally put forward a broad set of demands, including addressing issues like healthcare, education funding, job security and press freedom. 
Peace activists condemned the, the government's prioritisation of military spending and security measures to deter migrants rather than promoting peace and strengthening public services. They all called for decent salaries, job security, particularly for young workers, and progressive taxation. Participants were determined to continue fighting for change and hinted at the possibility of a general strike to pressure the government into backing off from its social service and human rights cuts. The CGIL is considering the option of mass industrial action in consultation with other workers' organisations, but the final decision is still to be determined by consultations with other workers' organisations. Anti-fascist action in San Bernardino. On Saturday, September the 30th, anti-fascist artist and mutual aid organiser, Eye Rolls and Bloodlust, held an anti-fascist community event in Southern California at Creative Ground Studio in downtown San Bernardino, where local residents were encouraged to paint over banners made by the neo-fascist group, The Proud Boys. The centerpiece of the event was a collection of freeway banners displaying hateful messages that had been hung by Proud Boys in the Inland Empire region. These banners, captured by a network of anti-fascist and queer activists, were placed in the studio's alley for the community to redecorate using colourful spray paint cans. The gallery also featured a timeline of fascist activity in the Inland Empire, a statement from the artist and a patio with anti-fascist art, zines, radical books and performances by local bands and DJs. A dedicated security team of anti-fascists and queer activists ensured the safety of attendees, deterring potential interference from local Proud Boys and others. Over a hundred community members, including families, children, artists, trans and queer organisers, participated in repainting the Proud Boy banners with messages of love, resilience and resistance. Attendees praised the event's cathartic atmosphere, the transformation of hateful banners into expressions of love and colour, the fact that since the event the Proud Boys violence has come to a halt, and the sense of community and healing that the event provided. As one of the anonymous attendees put it, last night was such an amazing sight, especially after the last two years of being afraid to exist in public. Just getting to be in this, that space with family and kids and queers of all stripes and not having to worry about being seen as some kind of threat was immensely healing. This beautiful community action can serve as inspiration to others. Writers strike win. In the 146 day battle, the Writers Guilds of America has emerged victorious and are celebrating what they call an exceptional deal with gains in every area they had hoped for. This victory can be attributed to a variety of factors, including effective organization, a strong picket line, a Gallup poll in the US showing a remarkable 72% to 19% margin in their favor, support from the SAG-AFTRA in promotion by celebrities and tactical errors made by studio executives. But perhaps most importantly, a crucial catalyst for this triumph was the writer's unwavering refusal to allow AI to be exploited by their employers. During the strike, opinions about the impact the AI threat had varied. Some believing it couldn't produce worthwhile scripts, others feared job displacement or its use as leverage to threaten or justify lowering writers' fees. However, all were in agreement that the power to decide how AI is to be used should not be left in the hands of studios alone. At a time when the threat of joblessness due to automation is at an all-time high, the strike has great symbolic significance, paving the way for similar struggles by workers in other fields facing the encroachment of AI and automation. US health workers strike and win. Around 75,000 Kaiser Permanent health workers in the United States won a 21% raise over four years after their historic three-day unfair labour practices strike on October the 4th to the 6th. Healthcare workers also demanded safer staffing levels, especially in the face of a global shortage of health workers. While in an official statement released, Kaiser Permanente appears to blame workers for the staffing shortage, 
Strikers argue that Caixa Permanente should do more to retain workers by offering improved pay and benefits. Better working conditions and pay are especially imperative given the cost of living crisis. This victory is transformative for the workers, offering substantial benefits to both employees and patients. It introduces a minimum wage for healthcare workers at Caixa Permanente, setting the minimum at $25 per hour in California and $23 per hour in other states where Caixa operates, and includes restrictions on hiring subcontractors and using external agencies for temporary staffing. The contract also mandates investments in job training programs, referral bonuses, and workforce development efforts to ensure a sufficient supply of future employees. Kaisa is committed to filling vacant positions, addressing one of the main demands made by the union coalition. Currently, 11% of positions within Kaisa remain unfilled. The agreement focuses on accelerating the hiring process, particularly for hard to fill roles, and aims to create 25,000 new healthcare workers over the next four years. As Labour Secretary Julie Su put it in a press conference, this agreement demonstrates what is possible when workers have a voice and a seat at the table. Collective bargaining works. It may not always look pretty, but unions have, throughout our nation's history, built the middle class. Thousands protest Conservative Party in the UK. Thousands of protesters gathered in Manchester on October the 1st during the annual Conservative Party Conference. Organised by the People's Assembly Against Austerity, the demonstration brought together various activist groups, trade unions, climate action organisations and anti-war and anti-racism campaigners. Demonstrators called for improved wages, lower bills and the removal of the Conservative Party from power. They also demanded measures to address the housing crisis, scrap anti-union and anti-protest laws, tax the wealthy to fund social care and security, and nationalise key sectors like energy, water, mail and rail. Additionally, health workers, including junior doctors and consultants organised by the British Medical Association, embarked on a three-day strike to demand a higher pay. Climate activists voiced concerns about climate pledges being reversed and the cancellation of a part of the HS2 high-speed railway project. Protesters also condemned the government's inhumane stance towards refugees and migrants and expressed support for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. The UK government is preparing for general elections in 2024, making these protests significant in shaping the political landscape. Unison, Public and Commercial Services Union President Francis Healthco warned that while it was important to push the Tories out of power, we also need to prepare unions and workers everywhere for a fight against the Labour Party. It is going to be a government of neoliberal reaction from day one, so the left has to prepare now. We don't want a change of government, we want an end to the attacks on our class. All power to the workers. Australian supermarket strike. Through the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union, RAFFWU, on 7th of October, Coles and Woolworths workers throughout Australia initiated industrial action by stopping working for two hours, marking the first national supermarket strikes in Australia's history. Workers in Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Sydney and Canberra were protesting against poverty wages unsafe workplaces with abuse, assaults, threats and harassment as daily realities. They are demanding living wages, safer workplaces and job security. Coles has threatened to not pay workers who uphold the union's bans on certain tasks, such as cleaning vomit and cleaning the manager's toilets. These strikes are part of a growing wave of union action among retail workers in Australia, challenging low wages and poor conditions in a sector with high union density rates. Despite Coles and Woolworths generating substantial profits, their employees remain among the lowest paid in the country. PLN will be watching this story as it develops. Auto workers continue strike. 
The American auto workers strike has entered its second month with around 9,000 Ford workers at the Kentucky truck plant joining the 25,300 United Auto Workers, UAW members, already on strike since October the 11th. Over 100,000 workers at Ford, General Motors and Stellantis walked out when the UAW leadership gave the signal. The Kentucky truck plant is Ford's most profitable facility, generating $25 billion in annual revenue. The decision to strike was made after Ford management presented the same offer as before, with no improvements. UAW President Sean Fain has emphasised the unity of the working class and the need for fair treatment from corporations, stating, we're not messing around. Why is it when they kill thousands of jobs, it's business as usual? But when working class people stand up and ask for more, it's a crisis? The working class in this country is fed up with being bullied by rich corporations and the wealthy. The working class in this country is sticking together. Well said. Don't forget viewers, the boss needs you, you don't need them. The 2023 Eco-Socialism Conference will be taking place on December the 2nd in London and online. The conference will discuss how to create an eco-socialist movement that is rooted in the trade unions, the communities, our schools, colleges and universities, in social movements and our workplaces. Organisers say that such a movement must tackle the big issues, socialising, private wealth, housing and land, ending the market economy, dismantling imperialism, fighting the abolition of borders, militarism, and policing, and for the social transformation of the economy from the ground up. Tickets are available online. If any trade unions or campaigning groups would like to sponsor or endorse the event, please get in touch with organizers. Mauritius decriminalizes same-sex relations. The Supreme Court of Mauritius has struck down a colonial era law criminalising same-sex relations, bucking a trend in other parts of Africa where a string of countries have passed or proposed anti-LGBT legislation. In a ruling on two cases brought by members of the LGBTQ community in the Indian Ocean Island nation, the court said section 250 of the Mauritius Criminal Code, which dated back to 1898 during British colonial rule, was unconstitutional. Jean Daniel Wong, the manager of the Arkansas Collective, the largest LGBT advocacy group in Mauritius, said the group's next priorities were to achieve legal recognition for transgender people, legalize same-sex unions, and fight hate crimes based on sexuality. Universal Safe Abortion Day in Latin America. On International Safe Abortion Day, September the 28th, Hundreds of thousands of women across Latin America, including Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico and Peru, took to the streets to advocate for decriminalization and legalization of abortion. Many wore green scarves and campaigned for legal, safe and free abortion. Abortion laws in the region are strict, with only a few countries allowing elective abortion, while others permit it only in specific circumstances like rape or health risks. In some nations, abortion is entirely banned and criminalised. Women's rights organisations and feminist movements have long fought for access to reproductive rights, especially among marginalised groups such as poor women, indigenous women, sex workers and the LGBTQ community. Collective efforts have been paying off, with several Latin American states, including Mexico and Colombia, relaxing their abortion laws within the last year. Keep it up, comrades. Quoll found in South Australia, thought to be extinct in the state for 130 years. A spotted tailed quoll considered extinct in South Australia and endangered nationally, with less than 5,000 left worldwide, has been discovered in Beachport, South Australia after over 130 years. The National Parks and Wildlife Service will perform genetic testing on the animal to determine its origin. The species had its last documented records in the 1880s in the Mount Burr Forest and near Robe. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to mexi at protonmail.com. 
Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Mexi, Catherine, Marshall and Jacob for script writing and production. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. And to me, Louise Croucher of Matriarchetype for hosting this one. It's truly been an honour. If you'd like to support the show, please go to the patreon.com forward slash positive leftist news or you can give us a one-time tip via PayPal. The link is in the description. <laughs>